What is up, NFL fans, and welcome back to another episode of the NFL Whip Around, the podcast where we talk about all the burning topics around the National Football League. I'm Jeff Hartman, and joining me as always, Coach KT Smith. Coach, how's it going? Going great, man. Happy to be here. A lot of, yeah, a lot of good stuff on tap this week. As always, it's been an exciting NFL season, man. It was an exciting week and, and even happening after the week ended in terms of the news cycle and things like that. Before we get to that, Coach, you have a good Thanksgiving? Do you have a good uh, holiday? Phenomenal. Gained three and a half pounds. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, counting. <laughs> that's the American way. I literally did. I weighed myself before and after three and a half pounds. So. Hey, it just do what they always do. It's water weight. Just water no, weight. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if stuffing counts as water, then you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I'm glad you had a good holiday. Uh, let's get this show off on the right foot. And let's talk about some coaches getting fired. That's right. There's been news of, uh, I've already heard leaks in Washington that Ron Rivera is all but done. They, they fired the defensive coordinator there. That's not what we're talking about, though. We're talking about a decision that was actually made. And that was the Carolina Panthers parting ways with Frank Reich. And really not even giving him a full year after the, all the moves they made when it pertains to acquiring the first overall pick from the Chicago bears, drafting Bryce young, putting a lot of pieces in place. They didn't just part ways with Frank Reich. They got rid of Deuce Staley, uh, the quarterback's coach, which I think was McCown. Not sure which one, but one of them, uh, this just was, it was odd. It was an odd situation. Coach, I want to get your take on this. Well, what were your thoughts on, on the Panthers just cutting ties with Frank Reich this early? Right. So, I mean, first of all, it's it's really it's odd for a normal organization, but it's not odd given the track record of this owner with this particular franchise. David Tepper, the owner in Carolina who made his his fortune as a hedge fund guy. He's a hedge fund billionaire. He's notoriously impulsive. He's a guy who expects results immediately. Uh, I read a quote from him. In an article I was reading about him where he said that like if he goes to a restaurant and he gets bad service, he thinks to himself, well, I could just buy this place and fire that waiter. I mean, you know, you know say, <laughs> say, say what you want about a guy who, who looks at the world through that lens. Yeah. But but that lens is is not conducive to building an NFL franchise. And if you look at what he's done since he took over the team in 2018, he's now going to have to hire his sixth head coach. I mean, that's amazing, man. You and I are Steelers fans. We've had three coaches, three head coaches in our lifetime. Uh, yeah. So so now we're talking to a guy who was six, six in, in five years. I mean, he, he traded away Christian McCaffrey, one of the best players in the NFL. He, he then used the draft picks that they got for Christian McCaffrey to acquire Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield. So they essentially traded Christian McCaffrey for Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield. They then traded, you know, two number one picks for the right to draft Bryce Young, one of those picks is going to work out to turn out to be the number one pick in the draft. Oh, and they also traded DJ Moore, their best offensive player. It just, I mean, he's made one bad decision after another. And I think it's just the fact that, again, he wants results right now. And and it doesn't work like that in the NFL. And so now he's, he's going to be in the same boat all over again. Knee-jerk reaction is what comes to mind when I think of David Tepper. Because he has no one to blame but himself when it comes to hiring the coach and hiring the general manager. So he might not be the one. Now there were rumors that he was the one in the draft room, this past draft saying, I want Bryce young. Like, that's my guy. That's who I want. They might've been saying like, what about CJ Stroud? He said, Nope, I want Bryce young. So whether that's true or false, I don't know, but still he seems like a meddling owner, which we know that meddling owners typically don't do well i.e. Daniel Snyder in Washington is a prime example. Boatloads of money. They're willing to spend it, but they just don't get the right people in the right places, and they also don't have the patience to let it actually come to fruition. But David Tepper has no one to blame but himself. I'm, I'm sure he's furious, and he's furious with himself. He hired Frank Reich. He's the one that wanted Bryce Young. He's the one that made all those moves, and still it's not working, and he's not used to things. Like you said, he's not used to things not working out for him. And this is where it's going to be really tough. The question now is, so we talked about the move that was made. Does, would, and why would anyone in their right mind want that job? No, I that, can't think of a reason why. Do you have one? No, that's a great question. I mean, somebody will take it because it'll be their shot. But if you're good enough to have other options, you're clearly not choosing Carolina. They're going to want an offensive mind 
to help develop Bryce Young. So think about some of the of the up and comers, right? You got Bobby Slawick, you got yep. OC in Houston, who's doing a great job developing CJ Stroud. Uh, you got um, the Ben Johnson in Detroit, who's who's you know uh, in the circle of names you're hearing. You're hearing Brian Johnson in Philly, his name get kicked around. But if you're any of those guys, you're going to wait this out because in a normal off season, there are there are six head coaching vacancies. That's the number that's about normal. This year, there may be more. I've heard people say maybe seven to 10. And so you're thinking about, all right, the Chargers job looks like it's going to come open. I mean, yeah. Justin Herbert, a hundred percent, you're going to go there. Um, the, you know, the bears job might come open. If you believe in Justin Fields, you have an opportunity to go there to, you know, not a great division. The Washington job could come open. I mean, there's, those are all far more attractive opportunities than what's going on in Carolina. And so if you're one of those elite guys, then, you know, I don't think you take that job. Hey, maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe they go for an end of career guy, you know, like a, like an older veteran guy who who's never had a shot. And he just sees this as maybe the only chance he gets. I'll give you a name that I think would say, I'll take it because I've been waiting forever. And if I just get a job, like give me a chance. Like just give me, it's Eric B enemy. Yeah, I, Eric B. Enemy has been waiting in the wings for how long in Kansas City and now even in Washington. And we all assume the Washington job is going to come open. But even if it does and they go somewhere else, there's rumors that they want to trade for Bill Belichick and they want him to be the GM and the coach in Washington. Good Lord. I hope that happens because it'll be a dumpster <laughs> fire. But still, yeah. if Eric B. Enemy is there, he might be saying, I don't want to be a part of this. So if Carolina says, hey. We got a, a really good young quarterback. It's a clean slate. Bring your bring your guys down. I got to think he would jump at that, would he not? He's not one of those guys like the 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 young and up and comers that have the patience to say, "I'm going to hold out and stay where I am. I'm not going to take this job just to take the job." The enemy's a guy that's intriguing to me. Is he intriguing to you at all, Coach? Yeah, and he he might look at Bryce Young and say, "I can fix him." <laughs> Some True. of the things that Eric Bieniemy does in in his offense fit Bryce Young's skill set and and you know based upon what the enemy liked to do in, in Kansas City. And so he might say, you know, granted, I don't I don't have a lot of the talent around him that I would prefer, but I do have the marquee piece, the quarterback, and I think I can fix him. And if I can get him right, everything will sort of take off from there. And he just wants a chance. He just wants a shot at being a head coach. And he's been the coordinator for a long time, been very successful. And so that's a name to keep your eye on if you're looking for someone that might jump at the Carolina job when most people would say I'll pass. But let's look at the other side of the fence here. We talked about this. You mentioned it. Since 1969, the Pittsburgh Steelers have had three head coaches, which is still mind-boggling and remarkable. It is the organization that prides itself on consistency and longevity. And so this week, though, they did something they haven't done since 1941. And they fired a coach, not a head coach, but they fired a coach mid-season. Matt Canada, gone. And how do they respond? I always point, I said this in my podcast, talking about the Steelers. Obviously, we cover the Steelers for the Steel Curtain Network. First play from scrimmage, tight end, down the seam, big play. And it just felt like, wow, everything's opened up. They go for over 400 yards the first time since Ben Roethlisberger was quarterback in 2020 against the Indianapolis Colts. Have they fixed it, coach, in Pittsburgh? And I mean the offense after just one game. Is it enough? <laughs> All right, two quick comments before I answer that question. One, for, for the for fans listening who are not Steelers fans, the Steelers throwing the ball down the middle of the field to a tight end for a completion is like a it's like a miracle, man. I mean, it's 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 uh you the can't whale. imagine, right? Yeah, you can't imagine <laughs> what that's like for a Steelers fan. Um and two, 58 games, right? You're right, 58 games the Steelers had gone without amassing 400 yards from scrimmage. And if you ever wanted an idea for how great a coach Mike Tomlin is, there were there were 10 other teams that were in that range of, of having gone 50 plus games over the last 30 years without gaining 400 yards. And the collective winning percentage of those nine of nine of those teams was 36 percent. Those teams won 36 percent of the games in which they did not gain 400 yards. Mike Tomlin won 60% of those games. The Pittsburgh Steelers went 34, 23 and one over that stretch of 58 games where they did not gain 400 some yards. That just gives you an idea about how, how that guy can keep that team together despite 
not having a prolific offense. So, so that's one thing. Now, the question as to whether they fix the offense or not, I mean, my answer right now is, you know, but TBD, right? To be determined. I'm not, I'm not willing to say yes, because that Bengals defense is not very good. Uh, and, and the Steelers still only scored 16 points, looked great, did a lot of things that Steeler fans have wanted them to do now for, you know, two plus years. Uh, but at the same time, man, too many self-inflicted wounds in plus territory and they wind up with 16 points. So they got to obviously finish, but needless to say, man, the early signs are very encouraging. This was this was odd, and I'm going to ask you this because we don't do a show on the Steel Curtain Network together, and I'm going to be talking about this on my Wednesday Let's Ride podcast, and it is going to be based on that the early returns, and it's only one game, which is a tiny sample size. You saw a change. I think we can all agree we saw a change, whether it was in philosophy, scheme, the play calling, how the game flowed. It was a significant, noticeable change. My question for you, you you, toted, you you talked about how Mike Tomlin is such a great coach, and I agree. But why did it take this long for him to see what we've been seeing now for over two years, coach? Like, mm. what was what, what was the stumbling block that prevented this move from happening? What we all thought it was going to be this offseason to get Kenny Pickett into a different system, give him an entire offseason. Instead, they wait until after week 10, or I'm sorry, week 11, to pull the trigger after a horrible Browns loss. That's the only sticking point with Tomlin right now because Tomlin was the one that wanted him gone. He's the one that put the pressure on Art Rooney to get him fired. He got his blessing, and then he was gone. What took so long, Coach? Help me out. Help me find the answer to this. Uh, I mean, two things. One, you said it. You know, the Steelers haven't fired a, a coach in season since 1941. That that's not they don't they don't pay coaches to not coach. That's something that they don't do. Canada's contract was going to run out at the end of the year, and. Their MO has just been to like not rehire those guys. But two, I think the reason Tom would press for it was that he was on the verge of losing the locker room. The Steelers mm-hmm. did the week before against Cleveland had a near mutiny, man. I mean, from the first play of the game, when, when they just failed mm-hmm. to block Miles Garrett and he came barreling in and, and blast, blasted Kenny Pickett, the, there were so many times where you saw Steeler players looking at each other, with throwing their hands up, confused, kind of bickering a little bit, miscommunication between Pickett and the receivers, Deontay Johnson having a meltdown on the sideline, uh, you know, getting into it with Minka Fitzpatrick, Najee Harris after the game, doing everything he could not to, you know, go off to the media. So, like, I think Mike Tomlin recognized, man, we're, 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 we've reached the boiling point, and I'm going to lose the locker room if I don't press for this, and that's probably what finally motivated him. Whatever it was, it seems to it worked for one week and it, it should work for the next few because they've got Arizona this week and then New England on Thursday night after that, both at home. We'll see how that goes. Let's hope that as we cover the Steelers and we are Steeler fans, let's hope that that trend continues. Okay, let's go to the third topic of the whip around, and that is what impressed you most on Sunday? Is it a team? Is it a player? Is it a play? Who or what was Sunday's most impressive performance for you, Coach? Go ahead. I, I got to tell you, man, I, I just, I'm so impressed with the Philadelphia Eagles. They just, you want to talk about a team finding ways to win. This is now two weeks in a row where they've been down by 10 points at halftime to a really good team. Two weeks ago, it was Kansas City. Last uh, On Sunday, it was Buffalo. And yet, they figure it out. They don't panic. They come back. Uh, Jalen Hurts is just so good, so cool under pressure. Uh, again, in the Buffalo game, Josh Allen plays out of his mind, one of his best games of the year. And, you know, this, and the Eagles are down to their last play, man. They got to kick a 59 yard field goal in a driving rain in order to extend that game. And Jake Elliott nails it. And then Buffalo kicks a field goal in overtime and the Eagles you know, go right down the field and score on a great play call. They just, they just, and the crazy thing is everybody's saying they're not playing their best football. They haven't played their best game yet, but they wait teams out, you know, and they wait for the other team to blink like, like against the chiefs, man, the chiefs had a chance to win the game late. And, you know, uh, the, the Scanlon kid, the receiver drops a, a, what would be a touchdown in the Buffalo game. Buffalo's got a chance to win the game in overtime and Allen and Gabe Davis miscommunicate on an option route. That would have been a sure touchdown. You, you blink the Eagles beat you. They've got four awesome wins. They've beaten Kansas City, Buffalo, Miami, and Dallas. Nobody's got that resume. They're 10 and one, and everybody just feels like they're not playing that well. So for me, right now, what Philly's doing is just the, like that's championship stuff, winning those types of games. 
let me ask you about this game because it was exciting. Like that, that was, this was the, uh, this was the culminating event of the week. And it was such a, it was a highly tatted game and it lived up to the hype. Were you like me watching Buffalo kneel it out at the very end? Like just saying like, you have some time, like what what do you, what, what's going on? It didn't make any sense. You and Josh Allen, like the, the clutch factor, everyone talks about, you have the it factor, right? You know, the, the pressure's on, you're going to make a play. Kenny Pickett, that's what he's only had. His, he, he hangs his hat on that, that nothing else. He doesn't have the yards and the touchdowns, but he's had the game winning drives, clutch drives. And when make the throws, when it matters most, Josh Allen's never won an overtime game in his NFL career, including the playoffs. To me, as great as the win was, it was also a really bad loss for the Buffalo Bills, who now are clinging to dear life in the AFC playoff picture with a really tough road ahead. What do you think about the Bills, how they played, and especially Josh Allen? Yeah, they played it conservatively for sure. You know, you think back to the playoff loss of theirs a couple of years ago when yeah. Kansas City, what did they need, 20 seconds to be able to, to I kick think it was, field I think it was less than that. I think it was like was 15 it or 18 that? seconds. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, it can be done. Josh Allen had over 400 total yards in that game. And so, you know, was that an issue of that they just didn't trust the conditions? But, yeah, you're right, man. It just fe- it felt like once the Eagles kicked that field goal, if you went to overtime, Philly was going to find a way to win. I was standing there. I was watching on my phone, trying to get everyone, all the five kids, getting ready for bed. Is 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 time consuming? So I'm watching on my phone, and I'm watching with my twelve, my uh, soon to be thirteen year old daughter. And so it's overtime. The Bills kick the field goal. The Philadelphia Eagles drive down the field, and right when they're in the red zone, right before the draw, I said to my daughter, "Here comes the draw." She goes, "What is that?" I was like, "He's going to step back one step and just tuck it and run." She goes, "Really? You think so?" I said, "Oh my gosh! Like I bet my house they're going to run a draw here." draw right up the middle great block by kelsey touchdown ball game and i was like this is unbelievable everybody knew that draw was coming except for sean McDermott because he brought a house blitz you know like he brought the worst sense. possible thing you could run against that particular play i was like oh here comes the draw jalen hurts has been killing him with the legs like all game especially in the second half and in the fourth quarter and even sean mcdermott's mo on defense in that last drive we went soft. Like he, he went more prevent and Devonte Smith was wide open. I'm like, what, what are they doing? It's almost as if they were playing for the tie. That's what it felt like to me. They're they playing like, we're just, we'll give him a field goal and we'll have a tie on our record, which I hate, but nonetheless, uh, I'll tell you what, what impressed me on Sunday. I, I look at this and, and we're going to dive into this a little bit in the fifth segment. But for me, it was, I, I, I gotta be honest. It was, it was Trevor Lawrence versus CJ Stroud. I said, I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. Cause I know that's a topic for later in the show, but uh, that was really fun to watch. I didn't get to see a lot of that game. I did watch the highlights cause the Steelers were playing at the same time, but the way that game ended, we'll talk about it. Let's go to the fourth topic though. We've reached the two thirds mark of the NFL season. If you had to hand out a coach of the year award at this point, who would it be? Uh, yeah, I, I think there's some great candidates. There's, there have been some remarkable coaching jobs in the NFL this year, and that would be a, a tough one. But for me right now, it's Sean Payton. I mean, the, the way in which he's brought that team back from the dead, they were 0-3 coming off of a 70-20 to loss to Miami where they'd given up 700 yards in a, in a single game. And all the talk was that they're going to blow it up. You know, they're going to blow that whole thing up. They're going to fire Vance Joseph, the D.C., they're going to potentially fire Sean Payton. Maybe they're going to bench Russell Wilson. And and yet now here they are at six and five. They've, they've won six out of their last eight. They've won five in a row. They've they've gotten Russell Wilson to buy in to changing his style. Man, they really have managed him differently. He's He only threw for 134 yards on Sunday, uh, but he managed the game well. He's not turning the ball over. He's, he's taking what's there. They're really going to a short passing game and letting him run the ball a little bit more. And then they've just figured it out on defense. They give up 70 points to Miami in the last five games that they've they've won all five. And they've played really good teams in those five games. They've played Buffalo. They've played Kansas City. they played Minnesota, Green Bay. Those are good offenses. They've given up 80 points total in those five games. So, I mean, what they, just to put that thing back together, hold that locker room together, keep that thing from deteriorating, is a remarkable coaching job, and they're in the thick of the playoff hunt right now. If Denver makes the playoffs after that start, I don't know how you give it to anybody else. Yeah, but there's always a part of me that says you also did start really bad, and that does that that does reflect coaching. Yes, you rebounded, but you should should you have to rebound because my selection is Nick Sirianni. 
because of all the reasons you said about the Philadelphia Eagles, how tough they are, how resilient they are. They, they have not had an easy schedule. And when was the last time a team lost in the Super Bowl and was this competitive the year after? Most of the time, the loser in the Super Bowl collapses the following year. They might make the playoffs, but they're not the number one team in the NFL. That's exactly what Sirianni's done. That roster has built, I have, feels like almost to perfection when you look at that roster from top to bottom, offensively, defensively. I would go with him, but I'm not going to I'm not gonna poo-poo the Sean Payton because the, that turnaround is remarkable. I don't know if they'll be able to keep it going. They've got some tough games ahead. But the fact that we're even talking about the Broncos right now in a positive light because we made fun of them earlier this season for having the Dolphins run up and down on them, I, I get what you're saying. You agree with Sirianni, though? Yeah, I mean, he's done a fabulous job, no doubt. I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from him. He's and he's such a Philly guy. He's so, he's like the right guy for that city and that team. He's got the personality that fits that team and that fan base. I mean, I'll just tell you this, man. Thirty years of coaching, and, and you probably know you know this because you're a coach yourself. I just know that like some of the best coaching jobs that I've ever done and that our staff has ever done came in years where we weren't that good, where yeah. when it was just an absolute fight to keep the team competitive and to get them in many ways to play over their heads, to handle adversity. You know, I mean, you're coaching your butt off all the time just to get you got your guys to, to stay above water. And then son, and then, and they fight and they fight and they fight and it clicks. And now you start to put some things together. I mean, there've been some teams that I've had, I mean, I, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to win a couple of awards from local writers and things like that, where, where all, we were so good that like all I had to do was not mess them up, you know, like, it, like you know, I mean, I'm not saying the team could have run itself, but like my, the job that I had to do was just more like manage things because right. the team was so good as opposed to those years where you're not good and you're just like, you know, everything that you can do, you got to push every right button to keep it from self destructing. I think there was a moment in Denver's season where it really just could have imploded and instead. They've turned it around. They're a confident football team. It always goes to a, a guy like Sirianni, you know, the, the guy who has the most success. And again, he's very deserving, no doubt about that. Sometimes, though, I just question: Is that always the best coaching job? You're right. You're absolutely right. We all, anyone that's coached, I'd say high school or above, for any duration of time, you've had those years where you know you don't have the talent that you've had other years. But when you can get those the, the team to do it together, and yeah. I'll give it to you. I'll give you Sean Payton. Let's go to the last topic before we get to our player profile. Is Trevor Lawrence versus CJ Stroud, the AFC South battle between the Jaguars and Texans, is it shaping up to be the league's next great quarterback rivalry? I don't feel like there are a lot of quarterback rivalries out there like there used to be when you talk about Roethlisberger, Brady, Brady, Manning, Breeze, Rivers. I don't even want to throw Matt Ryan into the mix, but I could if I wanted. I don't feel like there's a lot of those in the league right now, but do you think this is coming up to be one of those uh, great rivalries? Well, why, why don't you take this one? Cause you brought it up earlier, man. You take that one first. Cause I know you got some thoughts. Well, I, the answer to me is yes, because both of these guys have staying power. I mean, Trevor Lawrence has the look of a, a franchise guy. They're not going to let him go anywhere. CJ Stroud is basically tr about to blaze new trails for a rookie quarterback in terms of accolades and stats that he's putting up as a rookie signal caller. And that game was exciting. So when the Steelers game ended, they went to that, te that the Texans-Jaguars game, and I was like, all right, here we go. And I watched those back and forth. C.J. Stroud's exciting. Trevor Lawrence, sometimes he is buoyed by a really good defense that I think is very underrated, doesn't get a lot of credit nationally. But the AFC South, and then if you throw in Anthony Richardson and the Colts, who the Colts are still winning games with Gardner Minshew, I think that division is the, the future is bright for that division. It's going to be really, really tough. If you want to include Will Levis and the Titans, you can. I think that's the bottom feeder in the future. But still, the top three, especially the top two, man, is that going to be something to watch? Because what's funny, I didn't realize this, but when I was interviewing our Houston Texans affiliate for Fans for Sports Network when they were getting ready to play the Steelers, he talked about how the Texans actually own the Jaguars. Like it's rare for the Jaguars to beat the Texans. Now you have this matchup. I think it makes the it makes the game better, it makes the league better, it makes the division better. You agree, coach? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's nothing better than ha than having a, a great division rivalry with rival rivalry with great quarterbacks. Like yeah. I remember when I was in college, the NFC East, all four teams were good. 
and they all had a, a marquee quarterback. The Eagles had Randall Cunningham. The Cowboys had Troy Aikman. The Giants had Phil Sims, and the Redskins had well, it was Joe Theismann, and then after he got injured, it was it was Doug Williams who took him to a Super Bowl. But it was like all four of those teams were really good, and all four of those teams had a quarterback who could change the game at almost any time. And those matchups were always so exciting to watch. And so you can you can absolutely see a both Houston and Jacksonville being competitive, if not really, really good over for the foreseeable future. And then B, those games getting bumped up to prime time. Like you know, Houston Jacksonville next year is going to be a Sunday night yeah. game or a Monday night game, a prime time game. And having the hype surrounding it. And you know, you can see these 34, 31 shootouts that come down to the last minute. That that's shaping up to be uh, a division nobody paid much attention to to must see TV. So that's great for the game. It is. I, I do want to ask you, this is off the cuff, but it kind of ties in with the division talk and the competitive nature of the NFL. Did you hear Tom Brady's comments recently on the uh, Stephen A. Smith show about the mediocrity of today's NFL? I did, and I agree with him in, term, in terms of what he was saying uh, as far as like the reasons for it. The lack of, uh, of you know practice time the inability to really teach the game properly because of all the CBA rules, some yeah. of the habits that are developing in college. Now, some of it smacked of, you know, hubris, the whole, uh, you yeah. know, it was not, you know, it was all, it was better obviously when I was there, but, yeah. <laughs> but I, well, I did he, thought he, I thought he had some valid points for sure. He's caught some flack from former players saying, well, he also played in the most uncompetitive division in football in the AFC East. When you think back to those, those AFC each the Buffalo Bills were not these Buffalo Bills that we just talked about in this episode. Uh, the Miami Dolphins were really bad for a really long time. And the New York Jets, outside of a couple years with Chad Pennington and Mark Sanchez, they were nothing to talk about either. And so everyone's like, well, why didn't he say this when he was playing? You know, he's not talking about the mediocrity when he's actually lining up. But <laughs> two, he played in the AFC East, which was one of the worst divisions in football for almost his entire time in new England. So I see both sides, but I was curious about your take. I don't want to spend too much time on that because I can't stand Tom Brady, but anyways, yeah, real, all right, real quick on a scale sure. of one to 10 as a Steeler fan. Yeah. Who, who, who's, whose t- favorite team was routinely punished by Tom Brady and the Patriots <laughs> on a scale of one to 10. How much are you enjoying the current state of the new England Patriots? Um, 11, yeah, 11. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I, I love it because it, it there's just something about it. I can't believe they are as bad as they are, but I love every second of it, every freaking second of it. Cause I still swear if it weren't for the new England Patriots, the Steelers would have at least two more Lombardies probably in their trophy case, but that's neither here nor there. Let's finish the show up with a player profile. You want to talk about a former AFC North safety now in the NFC South of the Atlanta Falcons, Jesse Bates single-handedly really turning the tides against New Orleans saints this week. Coach, go ahead. Yeah, you know, two two thoughts on Jesse Bates. One, absolutely, his his game yesterday uh, or Sunday, early in the game, New Orleans leading three nothing and driving with the ball inside the Atlanta fifteen yard line, and he steps in front of a of a an out route, picks it and takes it to the house. So that's a huge swing in that game. A game that's going to be ten nothing New Orleans is now seven three Atlanta, and then the third quarter with Atlanta protecting a 14-12 lead and New Orleans again in the red zone makes a big hit, forces a fumble that Atlanta recovers. So, I mean, he single-handedly thwarted two New Orleans scoring drives. He's that that guy, man. He's that guy that changes games on the defensive side of the ball. You don't hear a lot about him. You know, he played in Cincinnati for a while and was fairly obscure, and now he goes to Atlanta, and they don't get a ton of coverage. Um, and yet he's, he's absolutely one of the best safeties in the game. And as I was watching the Steelers-Cincinnati game on Sunday, I couldn't help but think, as you know, Kenny Pickett was casually slinging the ball down the middle of the field that if Jesse Bates was in Cincinnati, man, that would be a different story. You know, I think the Bengals deeply regret allowing him to walk. Well, when you pay the quarterback, a King's ransom, you can't pay everyone. And they had to have space allotted. They knew they were going to give Burrow the money. And you're right. We watched that game against the Bengals. That defense is different without Vaughn Bell and Jesse Bates back there. And you, you said it, I think you hit the nail on the head. He's not a household name. You know, when you think about, but really the safety position isn't a household position anymore. 
even go back to the early 2000s. Who'd you have at safety? You had Bob Sanders, Troy Polamalu, Ed Reed, Brian Dawkins. Those were household names in the National Football League. Now, who are the safeties that people are talking about? Minka Fitzpatrick, probably. Anyone else come to mind, Coach, as a predominant safety? Buda Baker, he's hurt all the time. No, no, you're right because they they've taken the hitting out of the game. You exactly. know, I mean, and a lot of those guys were hitters, and and you feared right running some of those routes. We saw the Steelers running casually on, on Sunday because you knew you're <laughs> going to get laid out, you know, and and you can't yeah. do that anymore. So Jesse Bates does deserve credit. The safeties are still good in this league. I think they're tasked with doing a lot more. It's a different position than it was in the early 2000s. Jesse Bates deserves some credit, especially now that he's not in the AFC North. So there you go. <laughs> All right, Coach, any final thoughts on Week 12 before we call it a show? I don't have any final thoughts on Week 12, but I'm really excited for Week 13, San Francisco at Philly. Mm. That, to me, will be the game of the year. The 49ers have been talking trash all year long about how they got robbed in the in last year's <laughs> NFC Championship game because Brock Purdy got hurt. Uh, you know, the Eagles, I think, have just sort of been casually going about their business, and that's going to be, you know, I don't know what time slot that game is. On, on, 425. Oh, there you go, man. The national game on, on yes. Sunday, that will be uh, must-see television. It is going to be a fun one. We will be breaking that down next week. Before we go, though, Coach, what's coming up on the call sheet this week? Yeah, I mean, we're really going to talk a lot about coaching, a lot of a lot of fi uh, firings, you know, but, but whether it's the head coaching position or a couple offensive coordinators. We're going to talk about what makes a good offensive coordinator. Uh, what are some of the things that that maybe the fans don't see that go into being a quality offensive coordinator and and what might be some of the marquee jobs available to some of the, the young and up and coming OCs in the league right now. So, you know, if you like talking about offensive football from a coaching standpoint, it'll be a good breakdown. There you go. Great. And where, where can we find you on Twitter? Uh, at KT Smith, FFSN. And then uh, up on for you Steeler fans, there's a new uh, new call sheet breakdown of, uh, of the Steelers up on YouTube, breaking down their performance on Sunday against Cincinnati. Yeah, you can find that on the Steel Curtain Network's YouTube channel. And you can check out his writing at SteelCurtainNetwork.com. You can check out all of our Steelers coverage at the Steel Curtain Network just by searching Steelers or Steel Curtain Network wherever you get your podcasts. We do appreciate the support. Make sure you check out all of our Fans First Sports Network NFL coverage here, as well as on FansFirstSports.com. I am Jeff Hartman. You can find me on Twitter at J Hartman, H-A-R-T-M-A-N underscore P-I-T. Until next week, Coach, take it easy. We'll see you.